we have a new tool in the toolkit. It won't replace our discrimination, but it's a new sort of appendage with which we can work, and that is to look at the data, trust it, and try to find new stories based on it. So instead of interviewing a person, let's interview a database. Kenneth Couquier is data editor at The Economist. In the next 15 minutes, he talks about big data and how it will change the future of journalism. Welcome to Backlight Talks. So there's no one definition of what big data is, and that's probably a good thing because to define something is to limit it. However, what we're seeing is that we have a lot more data in the world than ever before, and we can do new things with it. So we have new tools with which we can extract meaning and insight from data. So the term big data is a very useful one to understand that there is something new here that's unlike in the past. Well, this is a pretty fundamental shift. Typically in journalism, what we did is we handled the information overload by writing stories about it and taking the world and crafting it and forming it into a narrative with a beginning, middle, and end. And it was very anecdote-based. It was the pattern recognition of the individual, of Victor Hugo, le journaliste, uh -huh. who would go forth, you know, man of the people, as the barricades were going up in Paris, and sort of interview people, understand people, look at the ordinary lives of people. And it was very individual-focused. And it was also very perceptive, insofar as we trusted the perception of the individual person to make decisions. Now, data journalism shifts this. It's actually a quite interesting rupture, historically. What's happening is we're now realizing that there's obviously limits to what the individual can know, and those perceptions are sometimes faulty. We have a new tool in the toolkit. It won't replace our discrimination, but it's a new sort of appendage with which we can work, and that is to look at the data, trust it, and try to find new stories based on it. So instead of interviewing a person, let's interview a database. Just as a person can be, uh, can be unfaithful to us in terms of the truth, so too can the data. So we have to be very careful that we bring our same suspicion that we do on an individual level to the data as well. But provided that we do that, and we do that with the same wisdom that we do uh -huh. ordinarily, this new tool is going to help us see beyond the horizon that we normally can't see, in the same way that, if you will, a compass allows us to know the direction that we're in, or an x-ray allows us to see under the skin, recognizing our own cognitive limitations and being able to tap this new wealth of information that's not understandable on an individual level but can be made comprehensible when we apply these new tools to them. So the skills that you need to be a very good journalist changes. You can just simply imagine uh, in the 1950s if you were a foreign correspondent for a great American daily newspaper what you needed to do to be very good. You really needed to have read the humanities uh, and to have known a lot about politics and probably had a very good uh, Rolodex of business cards to call. On the other hand, you know, would you needed to have been a computer scientist? Would you needed to have known about software development or about statistics or applied mathematics? Well, no. That wasn't the world we lived in, but that is the world we live in now. Well, so one example would just simply be the network map. Right? When we have a network map, we can understand the interrelations between individuals. So we did this right after 9-11, when we tried to understand, well, who are the 9-11 terrorists, and, and how do they know each other, and what were their backgrounds before? We wouldn't have really been able to have done that quite as well, uh, say, 20 years earlier than we are today. And even now, with new techniques, a company called Palantir has very powerful software that allows law enforcement to do this as well as others. It can make correlations and make connections and things that we otherwise didn't understand and didn't see. Yeah. So yeah. network mapping is a great technique yeah. to do that. But just simply looking at correlations and, th and things that we otherwise wouldn't have noticed because it's buried in the data and st statistical approaches allow us to uncover that. Many uh, websites right now take a look at all of the disclosures from the SEC, the S uh, Securities and Exchange Commission, and the U.S. for publicly listed companies, and look at the board of directors and see who serves on what other boards. Now, this is interesting. We have known that there are some people who serve on a few boards, and we also know that there's a handful of other executives who serve on many. 
you know, a shareholder of one company might feel very uneasy to know that three of their directors serve on 30 corporate boards. You know, can they perform the due diligence function of, of their corporate governance responsibilities if they have so much board affiliations? The pro answer would probably be not. So either way, you would want uh, investors to be aware of this. And it would be very hard for them to find that out by hand, if you will, searching through all of the, the disclosures and the filings with their eyes. But if you apply it to a computer, you get rid of those correlations. You can ask, you get rid of these limitations. You ask the question, and you get interesting answers. The world is a, is a complex place. We're learning more about the complexity because we now have data with which to quantify the complexity. And as a result, we need new tools with which to make sense of it. It, it was an easier time when you could have had uh, you know, Thucydides looking at the Peloponnesian Wars and thinking about uh, what it means to, to be a raconteur of, of past events. But today, that's not good enough. We need to, the, the, the issues that we're dealing with are far more complex. That it, it, it surpasses the ability of any one person to see 360 degrees all of what's happening. So what we need to do is tap into the data and use these new tools with which to do that, and then sit back and tell the story as we normally tell the story yeah. for our readers in a way that we can make them cry, make them remember, make, yeah. them, make them act, make yeah. them think differently about the world. So in the past, what we might do is we might interview one executive at a company or a few executives and try to learn meaningfully what that company is doing. And we're beholden to the person telling us the truth. Uh, we need to know um, the information, but we're only learning it, say, in a one-hour interview. And so there's going to be limitations to it. Now, the looking at the data can actually help us go beyond the particular of that one instance of interviewing a, a handful of executives at the company and look at what's going on that the company is trying not to disclose or what the company um, is doing that they're planning to do but they're not actually doing yet today or they've done in the past. So an example is if you, if when people were looking at Google's uh, income statement and its uh, balance sheet uh, in the early part of the uh, 2000s, this is around 2003, 2004, they noticed something really strange. There was all of these capital expenses that just couldn't be explained in the letter to shareholders. It just, there was no way accounting for why they were spending billions upon billions of dollars. And what we later found out was it wasn't that they simply needed to build server farms to actually house the computers to serve up search queries. They needed to start finding strong sources of energy because the server farms were what required energy and they started having to build out their own energy supply and their own energy grid to actually service those server farms. Now, suddenly the company does not look like an internet company anymore. It sort of almost looks like a steel mill. It looks yeah. like a foundry, yeah. right? Now, Google probably didn't have an incentive to disclose to other large infrastructural players in the internet, I'm thinking like Amazon yeah. and Microsoft, yeah. that this was, and then later Facebook, that this is what you needed to ante up to get into the game. But th they would eventually learn that, but they wanted to withhold that. So you, you could pick that up if you looked at the numbers where you wouldn't see it through the public declarations of the executives. But we see this everywhere we look. This is just one small example. I wouldn't want to simply say that, you know, now that journalists are armed with data, that they have a, they're the even, they even become more of a superhero with which they can leap tall buildings in a single bound. I think that's preposterous. Yeah. If anything, what we need to learn with these tools is humility, yeah. right? We need to understand that there's limitations to our knowledge. And frankly, the very best stories are always going to come from an inside source, someone who actually knows what's happening and who tells us it with yeah. a whisper in our ear the deep throat from Watergate, for so to speak. And it's not going to be through some hacker uh, in his bathrobe, you know, in his kitchen table. However, I think we'll have a lot of great scoops from, from hackers with their bathrobes at the kitchen table. Uh, I just think that at the same time, the most powerful ones will be from people who are well-meaning individuals who see corruption within their own organizations and whisper in the journalist's ear to expose yeah. it. The journalist of the future is going to have to look different. In the past, you needed to have a literary bent to be able to write on deadline. But now you absolutely need to know something about statistics, about working with information. 
It'll help to know a little bit of uh, computer programming to know what's possible. It'll be helpful to know a little bit about data visualization. Now, the same skepticism and the same uh, dedication to the craft, the, tame, the same art of storytelling will be imperative. I don't think that goes away. But you need new skills with which to interact with the information because the data's there and because that's going to be the new way with which you learn information for your readers. I think that you're going to have, indiv individuals will need to have a basic familiarity with these tools and with what's possible. But we're going to get there. I mean, you're not going to have people graduating from university that don't think in a quantitative way anymore because big data is going to touch all aspects of society. So I don't think you need to sort of train up journalists and force them to have PhDs and stats. That's ridiculous. On the other hand, I think you will see teams of journalists, the newsroom looking different, in which you have developers as well as writers, as well as if you call them mathematicians or data analysts, working together on stories and on projects. Typically today, if you're in a war zone, you see pairs of journalists working together. And the reason why is you have one guy holding the pen and the other guy holding the lens, yeah. right, the camera. Yeah. Yeah. And so because journalism is just delved into those two ways, that was the, the newspaper model, and the skills were sufficiently different that although both try to do one or the other when you're on a low budget, it's far better to have two who serve their own dedicated yeah. master, the image and the word. Yeah. Well, so too, uh, you can imagine we'd have two or three people working on data journalism projects. We're already seeing that in many newsrooms today, where you have people who are writers and people who are subject matter area experts in the domain that they're looking at, while you have other people who don't know anything, say, about um, the oil and gas industry. But indeed, they do know something about statistics, uh, data curation, cleaning the data, where to find the information, how to process it, and running regressions to learn new things about it. Together, I think this sort of team-based journalism is going to be required for data journalism because you're, it's going to be hard to find all the skills in any one place. Right. No one person is going to be able to do that. Just think about what a newsroom looked like, say, 100 years ago. You had the presses on the basement. You had uh, different floors being functional. So you had photography in one floor, and you had the writers in another floor. And that sort of made sense. You needed a dark room. The, the presses were expensive, and so they, excuse me, the presses were heavy, and so they needed to be at the, at the basement level. Well, that same function functional architecture and hierarchy still exists in newsroom today, but we've lost the dark room and we've lost the presses. So what we do have is the, is the graphics department in one place and the writers somewhere else and the research department, if there is one, in a third place. And that doesn't make any sense anymore. The way that we've seen in corporate America collaboration to take place and innovation to happen is by putting people together. And you can just imagine that the newsroom of the future is going to look a lot more collaborative. And these people who have different functional job titles are going to be working together in projects as teams and are going to have to probably sit next to each other. data can, on its own can be just as misleading as anything else we can put in print. And so that itself is not the answer. In fact, at The Economist, we have cut our reputation for doing something different, for not being a newspaper, but being a views paper, for not simply telling people what's happening, but telling them how they should think about it. Now, people, we like to present both cases to to our readers so they can choose for themselves, that they have enough information with which to come to an opposite conclusion than the writer has. But they want to know what the writer thinks about it. They don't want the writer to be divorced of his own opinions, because usually when you do that, it's a complete bald-faced lie. Um, you are embedding your values and your judgments and your biases in the story that you write, in the topics you take on, on the information that you put into those stories. And even when you reach for this impartiality and this neutrality, it is often delusional, or at least to yourself, or at least an illusion that you're trying to perpetrate onto the reader. So I think that that is, we should be more mature about what we think about when we talk about facts and when we talk about the story. It can be equally as biased when we're presuming to put forward naked facts. And you know, just the facts, ma'am, just the facts. When instead, uh, I think that wise readers are going to trust credible news outlets to digest the information and not try to be a mirror of reality and just show them the naked rawness of the complex universe, but in fact to digest it and say, I've looked at this topic, I've studied it, here's my conclusion, here's what I base it on, now you decide. Come with me, 
and, I'm, and, and, and consider my reasoning, or come to an alternative reasoning. That, to me, is a more reasonable way of, of stepping forward in journalism.